just a reminder to the half a dozen of you who are taking the course of credit that uh, you, on the one hand, are responsible for a project and that will be at the end of the course, a project written report and uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and uh, those of you, a couple of you, two or three of you have seen me recently about your, pro your project, but if you haven't seen me lately uh, about your project, I would, it would be good to see me about a status report. Uh, the, in addition, there will be an oral final uh, for each of you individually. Uh, my intention is to organize a time when I'll simulate a final early enough so that uh, early enough so, so that you can get a sense of the kind of questions I will ask. Uh, and so I will suggest that the, the half a dozen of you who will be taking that final get together and suggest a time that we should do that simulation. <coughs> um, any questions on anything? Okay, so we're now, we've been talking about our various statistics uh, of shape and met, met statistical methods. Typically, shapes live on curved manifolds, shape spaces, uh, and <coughs> we've been talking about how to do that. Uh, I just want to make clear the people who are sometimes interested in the notion of correlation uh, the, the correlation of, for example, the set of features on, uh, that describe a shape. Uh, correlation is simply covariance divided by, I don't know, standard deviation. Okay, so that is to say where each feature, instead of being the feature itself, is a modified feature, as that feature is different, different from its mean divided by, well, in covariance it's already subtracted by the mean, from the mean, but that difference is divided by the standard deviation. It's in units of standard deviation. Once you have the features normalized that way, covariance is just co correlation. Co correlation is just covariance. <coughs> um, Realize that statistical independence <coughs> implies zero correlation, but, but not the reverse. And a particular situation, if we had shapes that, for example, have two forms, right? And so the shape distribution the probability distribution is essentially got a mode for one of the forms of the shape and another mode for the other, and you get a, some kind of a mixture, if you will, between them. You get a probability distribution like you see here, a bimodal distribution. Then the, this issue of independence uh, can be affected by the dependence on which mode you're in. Okay, we've been talking about Gaussians <coughs> as if we knew what a Gaussian on a curved space was. Uh, <coughs> the eigenmodes of, that are produced by PCA, or for that matter PNS, uh, can be understood as the principal axes of a Gaussian, All right? So if you have a, uh, a probability distribution on a sphere, for example, and you have some sort of a mean, <coughs> 
and then you have like, so these sort of cross-sectional ellipses, but they're on the sphere. We're talking about the principal axes of that of those ellipses. Um, but we need to be more precise. And <coughs> What do we mean by a Gaussian? There are lots of definitions. Uh, one is <coughs> in, in uh, flat space. We're all familiar with this uh, constant times an exponential e to the half this analytic form, right? But what, hap what, what do you mean by that kind of a form on a sphere or on a curved space? Another way of understanding a Gaussian is something that's produced by diffusion. Diffusion it has to do with running, running a differential equation, often called the heat equation. Right? If you put down a point of heat in a, say, a three space, <laughs> and all the rest of the space is empty, and then you run this heat equation, what happens is, as a function of time, the temperature distribution grows like a Gaussian. And if, the <coughs> if, if it's uniform, the Gaussian is just uh, that all in all directions has the same standard deviation, but <coughs> if you make the conductance vary in uh, different orthogonal directions by different amounts, you can get a, a, a Gaussian that, that has a <coughs> a non-diagonal uh, non covariance function. Okay, but so the point is that you can run diffusions on curved spaces, right? So you have a point on a sphere, say this point here, and you have, you have some geodesic through that through that point and another one orthogonal through that point and you have different uh, conductances along each one, then you can talk about what happens to the temperature distribution as time is passed. So for without, without conductance, you have this equation that is here. Uh, and time is proportional to the variance. So the more time, the more the heat spreads, right? And if, uh, if you have a, instead of this Laplacian, which can be understood as the dot product between a gradient operator and a gradient operator, if you put a, co a conductance function that varies in direction on either side, you'll get a generalization of um, <coughs> the diffusion equation. And that defines can be a definition of what a Gaussian is. Uh, another common and useful definition is Brownian motion. <coughs> in Brownian motion, you have a whole, an infinite collection in principle at starting at a point, and you let this, these, each one of these elements take an a random step, 
in some direction. And that random step can be have a directional preference. Uh, but in any case, once you take that random step, you go to the end of that small random step, and you take another random step. And you repeat that many, many, many times, and, you do, and then you start a new element. And you let that also uh, move uh, in the same way, randomly. And what you end up with is that the endpoints of each of these steps end up forming a density function that's Gaussian. And so you can do that in Euclidean space, but you can also do that with regard to geodesic paths from a point. So you move from the initial point randomly to, to a, a nearby point, and then you talk about from that point you have all possible geodesic directions from it, and you can take another random step, and so on. And that process is called Brownian motion, and then you can define Gaussians according to Brownian motion, the, the resulting densities. Okay, that's sort of fine, but we would like to not have to run a differential equation or run a simulation of this Brownian motion. And so <coughs> we can look at this equation here, but where this distance, instead of being a vector dis di di difference, is a, well, it's a vector on a sphere. Right? It's the geodesic vector going from the point Z to the mean. Right? And that's just fine. From, from that, you can get a probability distribution that's analytically defined, except that the sphere is cyclic. It's not infinite. Right? So what happens is, Strictly speaking, the Gaussian in, in two space goes forever, right? Yeah, it gets very, very small. By three standard deviations out, it's really, really tiny. But nevertheless, it goes from forever. And as a result, what happens is when you start at a point on a sphere, as you walk around the sphere, you, you wrap around. It's a cyclic entity. <laughs> and so if you're going to do it, things very precisely, you have to talk about the density at a point being the sum of all, over all the wraps. It goes around and around and around, and it keeps getting an infinite number of wraps. And that's painful. Uh, there, is theory that uses the rap Gaussian. But a mo much more common thing to do is to use a, dis a probability distribution that is known to be in the limit Gaussian anyway. It is approximately the Gaussian that gives you an explicit formula. It's called the von Mises distribution. And you will find a whole lot of the literature uh, about Gaussians on the sphere saying that they use the von Mises distribution. And I'll show you the formula in the next slide. OK? Uh, so uh, the other work that I'm going to make reference to is work by Stefan Sommer uh, from the Uni University of Copenhagen. Uh, and um, He uses these random walks, these Brownian motions, for his definition of the, of the uh, Gaussian on a sphere. By the way, for those of you who are interested, uh, the, the question of the pronunciation of that city's name. Of course, in Danish, it's not, it's Copenhagen. But uh, in English, it's, well, do we say Copenhagen or Copenhagen? Hagen. And the answer is, Hagen. Uh, why? 
because <coughs> the Germans say Hagen and the Danes are, have some problems with the Germans. <laughs> uh, especially during World War II where, where they were occupied. Yep. Um, okay, so if you can, when you pronounce that city's name, say Copenhagen. Um, okay, so here is the von Mises distribution. You'll find a nice discussion of that on in Wikipedia. Uh, as it says here, it turns out to be the maximum entropy, the, the distribution with the most act, uh, entropy for data on the circle, uh, thought of as the, the circle e to the i theta, right? That, that circle in complex, in complex uh, two space. Um, uh, for which the, both the f first real and the first imaginary uh, circular mo moments, which are the coefficients of the cosine and sine of the Fourier fre frequencies, the base sinusoids, are specified. Among all, the, all, among all probability distributions with the, those two coefficients, it is the one which has the maximum entropy. That is to say, he gives the least information. Anyway, here is the formula for it. You see here the two parameters are called mu and kappa. Kappa is sort of like uh, in reciprocal variance. <coughs> and this I sub zero function is something that physicists and applied mathematicians love but we don't normally spend very much attention to. It's called the modified Bessel function of the first kind of order zero. Uh, anyway, the point is that it's a tabulated function. It's a function with no known, known formula. And you can therefore write down the probability distribution on a sphere using the von Mises distribution. I said I was going to talk about Stefan Sommer. The basic idea is that if you have one of these Gaussians on Gaussian probability densities on a sphere, and you've created it by some kind of Brownian motion, you have this starting place on the, on the sphere, the mean, and you can talk about paths on the sphere from one, from one place to another. So for example, if the sphere is a representation of directions, as we know a, a unit sphere can be, then you want to know the path from the initial direction to some other direction. And you're interested in the probabilistically most desirable path, the, the, the path that such that the integ integrated probability along that path is maximum. So this is about shape change, really. It's about the change from, for example, a direction to another direction. Or if you have a polysphere, you may have <coughs> many, many directions. Uh, that are representing a shape. And, the, and you're talking about what is the measure of shape change. It's a kind of geodesic, but it's a probabilistically weighted geodesic, right? You, you want to go on places that are more probable and not be going on places that have low probability. Uh, it turns out that the uh, the definition of this thing has seri serious mathematical challenge. Basically, what you need is at, at any given point along your path, you need a frame that you're talking about. And so that frame is starting out at the zero point, but it's somehow itself transforming as you, as you march along the path. 
Uh, and so Summer talks about how to create this <laughs> locally rolling um, frame. And then the whole business yields pads that are uh, <coughs> correspond to uh, measures of shape change. Okay, so it's not a measure of shape, it's a measure of, the, of how, how much the shape changes as you go from some point to some other point. Uh, any questions on that? <coughs> if you want to know more in detail, you read Summer's paper, but there's a fair amount of differential geometry there. Um, this diagram that you see here on S2 shows a Gaussian and it, the circles here uh, are in, indicative of the of the frame directions in the ten, in the new tangent planes as you march along the path. Uh, so Sommer did an example with corpora callosa. Uh, that's the plural of corpus callosum, uh, and these are the. Um, uh, Tom Fletcher, I think, used them as an example. Uh, anyway, the, if you look at the, the plane separating the hemispheres in the brain, there is this locus on that where the connections from the right hemisphere to the left and left to right uh, are particularly dense, and that region is called the corpus callosum, and you see an example of one in the lower left and another one on the lower right. And the main point is that if you're interested then in talking about how to change from a mean corpus callosum, for example, to a particular corpus callosum, you want the probabilistically more, most common path. You can produce the, pro the probability distribution as a Gaussian via essentially by covariance analysis, and then you end up with, at, every, at any given point in, on the, on the uh, corpus callosum, you can, you, you can be talking about the vector that is the, form, the displacement vector from that point to the other points that, that yield the most common, the most probable variation between the base shape, the, for example, the mean shape, and the target shape. Okay? Questions? Okay, so I'm leaving the, the topic of Gaussians now and moving on to the topic of hypothesis testing. We're going to be talking about hypothesis testing for two purposes. On the one hand, we have shape representations with a whole lot of features, right? And so any given uh, instance of a shape is the kth one is a, a big tuple of values. So it might be, for example, the normal at one point is a couple of values and a normal at another point is another couple of values and normal at lots of points is if you have n points you have two n values, right? And uh, we've seen lots of, but the point is these f, that these f tuples are typically very large. Hundreds, maybe thousands. And now we start off with two classes, for example, a diseased shape and an undiseased shape class. So you have a bunch of examples of people with the disease and a number of examples of things without the, the, per the person does not have the disease. And you're interested in what which of those features or which combinations of those features are statistically significantly different between the two classes. 
if you can say, for example, that in one class, the normal class, it, the change to the abnormal class is a, a thickening over here and a bending over there, then biologists can figure out, look into why that disease, uh, how the disease is associated with thickening over there and bending over here. And, and so you're saying it's not associated with either thickening or bending in, in, in between and not so associated with thickening over there or with bending over there, for example. Okay, so the point is that you're interested in which of these features are varying significantly between the two distributions. Okay, so that's to di test differences between classes. <coughs> But frequently, our objective is to produce classification methods between the two classes. Classification method means you train some <coughs> method so that when you come up with a new shape, you say it's diseased or you say it's not diseased, right? That's classification. You put the shape into one of the two classes. <coughs> um, Okay, that's great, but now we have two different methods or a whole bunch of different methods for doing that classification <coughs> and we're interesting, interested in which of the methods are best. Well, if it's a single method, which is best? <coughs> okay, and that turns out to be a hypothesis question as well. Is there a significant difference between the, the classifications produced by method one from the methods produced by, <coughs> for, sorry, the classifications produced by methods method two? So uh, another example is one that we've already seen in PNS. I remind you that PNS require, is a dimension reduction method. You start with a high dimensional sphere and you're trying to find the best uh, subsphere of dimension one lower, right? And then once you do that, you project the data onto that subsphere and you play the, the game of lowering again. At each one of these stages, <coughs> there is a choice and that is should I use a geodesic subsphere? So for our good old friend, the two-sphere, a geodesic subsphere is a great circle, okay? Or should I use a small sphere? If you have data, like on the example here, what you're interested in is a circle that sort of passes very near the blue points. And we don't care whether it's a, a great sphere or a small sphere. We want the best, the best fitting subsphere. Clear? But it turns out that if you have a cluster like we have here of points, Trying to fit the best fitting subsphere is a best fitting sphere of arbitrary, how do I say this, geodesicity. In other words, whether it, whether it should be a great sphere or a small sphere is an unstable choice. And it turns out that for, for those tight clusters, what you want is the subsphere to be the great, the great sphere, the geodesic through that point along the long axis of the best fitting local Gaussian. Okay, so there's a decision to be made at each one of these stages when you're doing, class, doing PNS, of which of the two you should 
choose? Which of the two choices? Should you make it geodesic or should you allow any, any size? And the point is that that decision depends on a hypothesis about what the shape of the probability distribution is of our data at that stage. And the decision can be made differently at each stage. I mean, it has, can be made separately and can, can say it's clustered at this stage, you should go geodesic, but it's not clustered uh, and fits nicely to a, to a small circle uh, in some other stage of the process. So inside the PNS algorithm is a hypothesis test to decide which of which of those two you should which of those two you should take. And so there has been a good deal of study by both Sun Kyu Jung, who invented PNS in the first place, and by Benjamin Elsner, uh, as to what the form that hypothesis test should take. So I've given you a bunch of examples of hypothesis testing, and the next part of the lecture has to do with the form hypothesis testing should take, <coughs> especially in curved spaces. In order to understand <coughs> uh, hypothesis testing, in curved spaces, and for that matter, in, fra in flat spaces is, is a good, re good result, <laughs> uh, we have to understand something called permutation tests. And I will be discussing permutation tests as a, a, an example for classification, <laughs> where we have two classes. You see the diagram on the, the upper diagram, you have the red class and the, the blue class. And <clears throat> you have a, a, a collection of possible methods that yield what's called a separation direction, the best separation direction in feature space. So this is feature space we're talking about here. And we're talking about the best separation direction that's indicated by the solid line between the two. Okay, there are a number of possible methods for choosing that separation direction. We will talk about them. The three most common uh, are the difference of the two means. It's the vector between the red mean and the blue mean. Another possibility is the direction orthogonal to the support vector machine separating plane. And another one is distance weighted discriminations separation direction, which typically is better than support vector machine. But fine, the point is that whichever of these methods we're talking about, the method yields a separating direction. And once you have a separating direction, in, on a curved surface, that separating direction is a geodesic, right? And now, what you're trying to do, what you're going to try to do is to take every one of the red points and project it along the separating direction, okay? So, and better be a little careful here. In, in flat space, it doesn't matter whether the line is the one shown or parallel to it, the projections will be all, all the same. They're projections orthogonal to that line, right? But, it, but be careful in three space because, I mean in curved space, because it matters which geodesic you're talking about. <coughs> when you're going to do projections along geodesics to it. So typically we, uh, 
we use the, that particular line that passes through the mean of the means. <laughs> okay, the, the global mean of the blues and the reds together. Fine. Okay, but when you do that, you get a blue density function projecting all the blues onto that, right? So you have a, uh, a separating direction and you have a blue point. And here you have its corresponding projected value, right? And you have another blue point over here and here is its projected value. And you do that for all the blue points and you do that for all the red points. And what you end up with is two histograms. Right. And the, so these are histograms of the projected points, the density of the projected points on the separating direction. And now what we're interested in is it, how statistically significant are those two histograms from each other, right? <laughs> how far apart, how strongly can you believe that, that those are different? And for example, for a classification method, you would like classification methods that produce more statistical significance <coughs> Okay, so this ability to say how statistically significant has two, there are two possible methods that people use. And I'm gonna talk about both of them. One of them is, involves using <coughs> permutation tests. And I'm going, the features that we're talking about sometimes are not individual scalar features. So for example, a direction is, <coughs> even on an ordinary two-sphere, is a duple, right? It's a latitude and a longitude, for example. <coughs> and so these points are in a feature space in that example <coughs> that are on a sphere and one point is really a duple, not a, a single one. <coughs> and so, so as to not simply talk about features, which are the word feature suggests a single scalar sort of thing, I'm going to use the word GOP, it's not a political party, this is geometric object property. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and these are the places on our curve space that correspond to the points. And <coughs> realize that, for example, if you have a polysphere, a, uh, a collection of GOPs can make up a point that has a value on the first of the spheres making up the folly sphere, another, a place also in the second, a place also in the third, and so on. So you can end up with a feature tuple, like you have here, that's many uh, that's high dimensional. <clears throat> and the general question we're asking is which of these features are important, for example, if you're trying to classify between diseased and non-diseased shapes, which of the features are different, statistically significantly different between the classes and which aren't? And so you end up making tests <coughs> not simply globally, namely, is it different between this and that, but tests on is this normal dif different? Is that normal different? Is this 
rotation of a fitted frame different? Whatever the GOPs are, one by one, you end up doing what's called multiple tests. You're making a test on each GOP. And it turns out that the, when you make a, uh, you make multiple tests, you can sort of get an indication of significance simply by random, at random, meaning it, it really wasn't a difference. And it comes from the fact that all the tests together, all their probabilities sum up to give a likelihood that one of them may be significant when it really isn't. <clears throat> and so it turns out that when you're doing shape analysis, where you very frequently have these high dimensional feature tuples <clears throat> that you're doing tests on, you need to do a, what's called a correction for multiple tests. And we'll see how that works also. This general approach of using these kinds of permutation tests for hypothesis testing for evaluating classification methods is discussed in section 13.1 of the Marin and Dryden book. And it's a, a method that Steve Marin developed that he calls diproperm, where I think di talks about is direction, pro is projection, and perm is permutation. <clears throat> and so we're going to be talking about these permutation tests for making these decisions. Okay? Any questions? Um, <clears throat> the thing about hypothesis testing is the question we think we're at, we think about intuitively answering, is there a significant difference? And it turns out there's no way to answer that question directly. Instead, you answer it by a double negative. <clears throat> you say, what's the chance that if you had no difference, that these differences in the, in this case, histograms, would happen at random, would happen, would happen reasonably likely when there was no difference between the di two distributions. So you're assuming that there's this un underlying distribution, a single distribution, <coughs> which is the same for both class, classes. And now you're asking, how probable is it that you would get the data that you're getting given that null hypothesis test? <clears throat> OK. So you basically go about assuming the null hypothesis. I emphasize, assuming the null hypothesis and then studying what can hand happen at random under that null hypothesis. And if that probability that it happens at random is bigger than some threshold that we check, that's called P0, then we say, nah, it could happen at random. We, don't, we, we have to accept the null hypothesis. But if the probability that it happens at random is less than this criterion level, which typically in shape analysis is num numbers like 5% or 1%. Uh, if it's less than that number, we say, ah, it's a really low probability that it would happen at random, so we will reject the null hypothesis, which we take to mean then probably the original hypothesis that there is difference can be accepted. But strictly speaking, we're not accepting the hypothesis that they're different or rejecting that they're not different. Okay. <clears throat> 
sorry if this is a rep repetition for those who understand this hypothesis. Okay, so typically what we have is training data, right? We have a collection of entities in group class A and a, a collection in class B. And for each class, we can compute a mean. So we have two means, one, one for the blue class, one for the, well, one for the group A, one for group B. We can look at the difference of those means as a multiple of their standard deviation. A, the multiple of the standard deviation of the difference. And the standard deviation of the difference of two means is the variance of the one class divided by the number in that class plus the variance of the other class divided by the number in that class. That's the variance of the mean to the half gives you I have a question. Yes. It, this is Sam, by the way. Um, is there, I thought there, I, okay, I remember from high school statistics that, that the I A quadrature has some assumptions about the independence. It, like, I thought that's assuming that the, they're independent or uncorrelated or something. Right. Uh, and yes, that is, that is an assumption. Uh, that um, is uh, <clears throat> I guess like uh, uh, go ahead it, Sam. It, I was just gonna say a lot of the time I think like since we assume I like uh, IID, like pretty much all the or not all the time, but in simple in like univariate cases, we're usually assuming they're IID from the same distribution, which I guess satisfies the requirement. Right, that certainly satisfies the requirement. I, basically, what I was going to say is all that you need is the assumption that that univariate value is taken uh, at random from that class, that, this, that the decision on which, ver that, which uh, sample to, to take from the infinite number of possible samples that you could take is done without reference. The second one you take is not correlated with the choice that you made for the first one. And once you make that, then you, you satisfy this requirement. Um, okay. So this is difference of the means normalized by its standard deviation. And that value is called the T value, OK? And if the probability distribution is Gaussian, then there's a whole table that you can do to look up significance as a function of the values, the value of this T value. But typically, we don't have that. Right? We don't have the assumption that things are necessarily Gaussian, and especially on curved spaces, you can't necessarily understand that these <coughs> values are behave according to a re reasonable Gaussian assumption. So there is, a, uh, is you replace this so-called t-test by what's called a permutation test. And the basic notion of a <coughs> permutation test is that if you have a probability distribution on those dif differences on the null assumption, so if you had the null assumption, then you have whoops, you have Here's t, and you have some probability distribution on the null assumption that the t values would happen. Right? If you have that, that density function, then if your particular t 
is out here, it says that it, the probability that it or greater will happen at random is the integral of the remaining little piece of density function here, <coughs> which is very, very low. Whereas, if our t value is here, the va this value of greater would ha happen with that probability, and that's too high. <laughs> okay? And so the general idea then is to create this distribution on the assumption of the null hypothesis and then to take the, the particular t-value that you got from your training sample gives you a t-value and you look at where it fits in this density function. Any questions on how that works? <coughs> So how do you create this probability density function? And the answer is by permutation. So the idea is that if the null hypothesis holds, group A and group B come from the same probability distribution. Right? That's the null hypothesis. If that's the case, an element that was labeled group A could just as well be group B. And one that's labeled group B could just as well be in group A because they both come from the same probability distribution. And therefore, we can swap, we can permute, we can take a random method, a random element of group A and call it group B and replace it by a random element of B that moves to group A. And we do that m multiple times. <coughs> okay, so we take a bunch of random elements from A, put them in B, and a corresponding bunch of elements from group B and put them in group A. And if we do that, we haven't changed anything on the null hypothesis because they're all samples from the same probability distribution. And so the result is each one of these permutations yields a t-value. And if you do that a million times, you get a histogram of t-values under the null hypothesis. Okay, so this is the probability density density of T under the null hypothesis. But that means over all these permutations. Right? So it's really easy because typically group A is big. Okay, so you have, you know, a, a couple of hundred samples in group A and a couple training samples and a couple of hundred in group B. If they're not the same, there's a little, you can play around with that, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Say they're both the same and we take how many if we want, want to be able to, uh, how many permutations are there from uh, two groups of 200 taken, two at a taken n at a time? And the answer is it's an extraordinarily large thing. It involves factorials, right? And therefore, you can create a, so many of these permutations that you can get a very stable value of this permutation, of this uh, t, distri t distribution, so-called empirical t distribution. And once we have that, we have the ability to take our t sub zero, the one that came from the actual difference, <coughs> and say, where does that fit in this distribution? Okay, we can, <coughs> okay. Any questions on how permutation tests work? Okay, so for shape analysis, we have these high feature, large number of features, typically that because they, they, the features run over many, many locations. And so we end up with wanting to get 
saying, well, in these regions, the, uh, the null hypothesis is rejected. And we can say by how much, right? Because we get a p-value that's bigger than our, our criterion. There's some criterion level that has a p-value that maybe is 0.05 is this, is this uh, area down here. And if our, p, if our t value is greater than this one, then its probability is going to be less than 0.05 and we're going to reject the null hypothesis, right? And we can record the p-value by displaying it on the surface, for example, and we get interesting results, right? Okay, so the problem is that so far I have described this with a single random variable. Okay, and that random variable has a scalar, it's a scalar value, and that's a scalar mean, <coughs> scalar standard deviations. And that's just fine, but that's not our shape problem. Because we have feature tuples that are, well, I'll rewrite it here, which are, a zillion features, a couple of hundred features, whatever. And so if we were to take a mean of this, it would itself, a mean over the k's, it would also be a tuple of that size, right? And besides which, what mean should we want to take if we have a curved distribution? Nope, not a for shame mean, probably. <coughs> Although that's not a bad answer, I got a better one. Backward mean, right? Okay, but nevertheless, you have this, and so you would end up with a mean for class A and a mean for class B, a feature mean. And now you're interested in things like the difference between these two places, each of which lives on a curve space. And so you need to talk about geodesic dis differences between those two means. And then you also need to worry about what happens with the standard deviations down here, <coughs> which are a whole covariance matrix worth of, of them. Well, they're the eigenvalues of our covariance matrix. Okay, so the upshot is we have to do something to handle the, to handle this dimensionality of our features, right? And we have additional problems, two of them. The first is that the features that we're using are frequently non-commensurate, right? So how much size, if, if one of the features is the size of the object, how much size is worth how much difference in the rotation of some fitted frame? Okay, those could be two BOPs, two, two geometric object properties. And you have this question of how, how the features, the features' importance are. 
The other problem is this problem of multiple tests. If we're going to test on a hundred GOPs, hundred geometric object properties, if our criterion is <coughs> 0.01, that is to say, we will we will call the null hypothesis rejected if the probability of the difference is greater than 0.01, and we do each one independent each we take each one and treat it as if it was uncorrelated with the others. Well, decorrelation is, is going to be something we're going to need to worry about, but, let's, but the, you, that's what PCA does for you, or PNS. It, it produces uncorrelated features. The derived features that you get from PCA, they're not necessarily independent, they will be independent if it's truly if the situation is truly Gaussian, because for a Gaussian uncorrelated, uh, an uncorrelation, uh, a covariance matrix that corresponds to a Gaussian with that does produce independence. But in any case, even without the Gaussian assumption, we can assume we, we can use PCA-ish application to produce uncorrelated features. But uncorrelated features still has the problem that if we test them one by one, and they really were statistically independent I mean, from each other, the probabilities add. So if we had 50 features, 50 GOPs, each with a criterion of 0.01, the chance that one of them would, would be at random greater than 0.01 is 50%, 50 times 0.01, right? So the problem is that you have this multi effect of multiple tests, that you can't talk about a criterion of point to one per feature as if it was that by itself if you're doing 50 tests, 50 features, 50 GOPs. Well, one possibility is to say, well, so I won't make my criterion point to one. I'll make it one fiftieth of that. So now I'm only going to accept the test if it's 1 50th of 0 0.01. Uh, because then 50, 50 times it will be 0 0.01, which is what we wanted. Right? Well, it turns out that that is the right thing to do if you truly have independent GOPs. But in shape, the GOPs are highly correlated, at least in neighborhoods. That is to say, for example, a normal here and a normal here vary, tend to vary together, right? If the normal swing here swings a little bit that way in, in a sample, the one next to it will tend to swing the same, roughly the same way. There's a large correlation between our features. And if you take this, the extreme that there's one variation and all the other ones are fully determined, are fully, absolutely, co perfectly correlated with it. So if I move this guy by 5% in this direction, all of them will move to 5%. Then wait a second, there's really only one test. If, which, if you test one of them, all the other ones are not, don't need to be multiply tested, in which case there's no correction needed. The major point here is that the multiple test need 
the amount of correction depends on the correlation among the, among the GOPs. Okay, so we have both non-commensurability and different probability distributions for the various features. Okay, so this just gives some examples of what I've talked about, log lengths and PNS pairs uh, for that give directions and, and fitted frame rotations and so on. Uh, so we have ultimately this need to estimate probability distributions among these correlated features. And then we need to come up with a P or a Z value that needs correction depending on their correlation. Okay. So, feature by feature, a mean difference of that feature is in the units of that feature, right? So, volume minus volume or difference between volume is, is in units of volume. Direction, difference between direction and another direction is in units of radians, right? Et cetera. In order to be able to analyze this whole thing, we need to commensurate our, feet, our GOPs, our different GOPs from each other. We talked a long time ago in this course about commensuration, but I'm gonna talk about it specifically here. And the clever idea is if we can turn our T distributions we've seen here, into distributions of a probability value. Probability values are commensurate with each other, right? So we can, if we can modify, make every t turn into a probability, now we have a, mo a different feature. For, for one particular GOP, we have its t distribution <coughs> its T distribution, and we're going to use that to, to turn that into a modified feature that wh whose distribution is going to be a probability distribution. And once we do that, if we do that in a clever way, we can make this probability distribution something we really like, like a Gaussian. Okay? And then we're pretty fast. City. Okay, so um, so now we're going to talk about permutation tests on multiple variants, a multivariate permutation test. And so now in this diagram. There's a tuple of features in group A, and you have a lot of, a lot of such tuples, training examples, and a tuple in group B, and each of those <coughs> uh, are the same size tuples. And we're gonna play the same old permutation test, except we're gonna be permuting the tuples, not within the tuples, but between the tuples. So we're gonna take, under the null hypothesis, some of the tuples from A and put them in B and some of the ones from B and put them in A and then under the null hypothesis just that's perfectly fine. And so we're going to play the same, have the same effect. We've got a couple of, uh, well, I'll fix this later. But, well, come on. 
room. But fine, we will. All right. So. What we want to do is fix this in incommensuration problem and make things. There's another SJ down here that I'll, I'll later throw away. OK, anyway, how do we do that? This is just a restatement of the, uh, the, the problem when you have many features. What we're going to try to do is turn T's into P's where this distribution is Gaussian. And not, not only Gaussian, we're going to want to make it our really friendly Gaussian, namely a, what Sam called an IID, identity uh, <coughs> independent Gaussian. So we have that it should be a, no, a zero, this probability distribution should be normal with mean zero. Our good old friend, the uh, isotropic Gaussian. And Here's the trick. If <coughs> if you have a variable with a particular histogram, okay? So let's talk about a scale of variables right now. It has a particular histogram, whatever it is. And you turn that into the cumulative distribution of this whatever it turns out to be, right? Which is the integral from minus infinity up to that point of the value of the original distribution. And you use that as a mapping function on the original variable, that variable v, called it F before, so let's call it F. If you look at C of F, that distribution is normal. I'm sorry, is uniform. <coughs> this thing goes from 0 to 1, assuming this guy is normalized. C of f is a value between 0 and 1, and its probability distribution is <coughs> uniform on 0 to 1. So we can take any one of these individual scalars and apply this trick, and we can make it uniform. Well, that's pretty good, but we didn't want it to be uniform. We wanted it to be Gaussian. Well, that's fine, because if we take a Gaussian and apply this trick, we make it uniform. And therefore, but if we do the inverse of that transformation, we're turning a uniform into a Gaussian. And so we play this double, double step trick, right? For each, we'll have to worry in the next time about what happens when the gops are not scalars. But for a scalar, what we've seen is that if we first apply 
this cumulative distribution function to it and then take that and by the inverse of the map that you get from a Gaussian from the ordinary zero, mean zero standard deviation one Gaussian, we've just by that combination, the composition of those two transformations made ourselves have this modified variable be standard Gaussian, standard normal. Okay? So, once we do that for all of our GOPs, we are going to be in really good shape. And we'll talk about that next time. Okay? Till Thursday. <laughs>